I always wanted to be Atticus Finch. Principled, respected, compassionate, but those aren't attributes associated too often with the modern day lawyer. Instead, we have become the butt of a joke. A guy once asked me, how many lawyer jokes are there? <laughs> and when I responded, millions, he said, no, there's just one. The rest are true stories. <laughs> you know the jokes I'm talking about. What do you call a thousand lawyers chained together at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. Why isn't a lawyer ever attacked by a shark? Uh, professional courtesy. <laughs> the post office just recalled its newest issued stamp. See, the stamps had likenesses of prominent lawyers on them, and people kept spitting on the wrong side. <laughs> it didn't used to be like this. In fact, until quite recently, a lawyer's word was often better than a written contract. The local lawyer would be extended lines of credit from bankers and merchants on nothing but unspoken obligation. It's not like that anymore, though. By refusing to learn from the lawyer jokes, my profession has assassinated Atticus Finch. You know, Shakespeare has this great line about lawyers. Some of you may already know it. For those of us that don't, here it is. That's the line. Now, at first glance, it seems funny, and it seems demeaning. But when viewed in context, it frankly couldn't be more flattering. You see, Dick the Butcher, this guy that said that, he was not a good guy. And he understood that the rule of law would keep him from power. So he naturally opposed it. Shakespeare understood the lawyer's true role in society as guardian of unemotional, independent thinking, as protectorate for the most vulnerable among us, as a furious advocate for justice in an imperfect world. In the community I want to live in, the lawyer is a pillar. He's a confidant and advisor part of a system that in totality fosters and furthers justice, not just winning at any cost. In other words, in that community, the lawyer is the glue that holds everyone together. Today I'm gonna to talk about five ways that we can help make that community a reality. First up, this realization. You know, all too often, lawyers are seen as looking to kick someone's butt just to make a buck. You've seen the signs, you've seen the billboards. Hire me, I'm your gladiator in a suit. It's that mentality, that typecast, the one that Abraham Lincoln so long ago warned against that causes the lawyer to recommend a lawsuit over a sit down. That pushes and prods the lawyer to compel his clients to trip over a dollar and a colleague to pick up a penny and an enemy. We lawyers must more tightly embrace the role of counselor than the job of mercenary. We must assist our clients to prevail in fights without instigating those fights. We must be courageous enough to tell clients no when it is a pound of flesh or unjust enrichment that they seek. Without that longer term mindset, we ultimately do our clients a disservice. It is the loftier goals that take our profession from a job to a calling. It is the loftier goals that give society comfort that at the end of the day, Lady Justice will reveal herself amidst all the chaos that is our legal system. To Kill a Mockingbird has pretty much 
always been my favorite morality play because at its core is the precept of one justice for all. It's a belief that the rule of law is the process by which we all can collectively achieve individualized justice. And that's the fundamental underpinning of any fair society. It's about having a level playing field for the aspects of our lives over which we do have control so as to minimize the relevance of the aspects of our lives over which we do not have control. After all, Atticus Finch didn't fight so hard to defend Tom Robinson because Tom was black. He did so because Tom was innocent. Two. You know, it's quite possible that the existence of gated homes has done more to harm our communities than the events and occurrences that led to the erection of those gates. It's the I'm better than you notion that those gates stand for that feeds the us versus them mentality. The gates don't just literally separate us. They mentally separate us. They emotionally separate us. Now, it used to be that your lawyer lived just up the street. Now, he too often lives up on the hill, and you need a gate access code just to knock on his door. That kind of voluntary removal from one's clientele is not sustainable. We lawyers need to distance ourselves less and participate more. Without that sense of interconnectedness, the lawyer will forever be seen as an interloping parasite out to make a buck off the miseries of others. Three, the judiciary must be a better gatekeeper. I love that one, it's my favorite one. <laughs> I'm actually gonna go off script here for a second. So if I run a minute or two long, I apologize. I just had a, a memory of something that seems appropriate and I want to share it. Um, I was once sued personally just for representing a client. And while I eventually won, of course, um, <laughs> It would be hard to overstate the huge energy and time suck that that litigation caused me. For a time, I lost my health, and I almost lost my practice. So for me, this isn't some sort of academic, abstract consideration. I know on a very personal level the pain that is caused by meritless litigation. Now, I know some of you are no doubt thinking, there's nothing that can be done about that. It's just the way it is. And I respectfully suggest to you that simply because it is the way it is, and it is like that, does not mean it needs to be. We as a country have fallen into a mentality of, Something bad must happen. There's got to be someone to blame. There must be someone to sue. We've gone from this shining country on a hill, the United States of America, to America, the land of the reality show. As a community, as a country, we don't just fail to discourage litigation. We nurture it. And that fact is sad. And that fact is disheartening. And that fact is disgusting. Meritless litigation costs each and every one of us, in this room and worldwide, every American, thousands of dollars per year, even when we're not a party to a lawsuit. How? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Here's the answer. We pay more for cars, we pay more for contractors, we pay more for groceries, we even pay more for our kids' soccer leagues 
because those businesses and organizations are stuck with sky-high liability insurance premiums. And a lot of that premium is attributable to meritless litigation. We as a community need to hold ourselves accountable. We need to hold litigants accountable. We need to hold lawyers accountable. Our state judges need to be statutorily empowered like their federal counterparts to toss meritless litigation much earlier on in the process. To financially penalize those litigants and lawyers that filed the meritless cases and motions in the first place. If we can adopt as law those disincentives, those levels of accountability, our court systems will be greatly streamlined. And that is a benefit to us all. Four. It's true. It's very true. Uh, we do have too many laws, and we certainly have too many stupid laws. A community cannot be a community without a sense of societal cohesion and predictability. That requires a knowable, reasonable body of laws. That's something we just don't have. Now, given that next week is tax day, there seems, of course, to be no more time appropriate or situation appropriate example than the United States Internal Revenue Code. There is no tax preparer. There's no bookkeeper. There's no certified public accountant. There's no enrolled agent. There's not even a tax attorney anywhere in this country, anywhere in the world, that knows every intricacy of the entire Internal Revenue Code. Given the impact of, of that code on our lives, on our daily lives, especially every April, it kind of seems to me like a bad idea. It seems that there should be somebody who knows that sucker inside and out, but there's not. It's, of course, not the only example. There are lots of examples of needlessly complex and convoluted and downright stupid laws. Some of them are funny. Let me give you some examples. In Georgia, there is a town that expressly prohibits chickens from crossing the road. <laughs> I didn't make that up. There's another town in Georgia that has felt it sufficiently important to adopt an ordinance that prohibits any of its residents from eating fried chicken with a utensil. <laughs> Tennessee has a law that defines dumb animal as including every living creature. <laughs> Utah has a town that requires its residents to walk their dogs on a leash, but only on odd-numbered days. <laughs> There's a town in California <laughs> that prohibits any man from wearing cowboy boots unless he owns at least two head of cattle. There's a town in Washington that adopted an ordinance making it expressly illegal to harass Bigfoot. <laughs> now, I admit these are some awfully funny and obviously idiotic laws. But before we get too lost in the humor, let's not lose sight of this one fact. Every one of those laws was enacted by legislators and signed into law by executives, all of whom were paid with tax-derived dollars. Think about that for a minute. Taxpayers paid for those absurdities. And I respectfully suggest to you that they need to be wiped off the books. Having them on the books cheapens the meritorious laws to their left and right. And it needlessly complicates our efforts to live communally within the entirety of the law. Five. This one's going to be hard to believe. <coughs> but it's a fact. Most law firms struggle desperately to remain profitable. Most lawyers can't afford to hire a lawyer of their own. 
And that's really the problem, isn't it? The lack of transparency. It's a facade of success. It's a, an illusion of financial acumen. It's like the real estate agent that hasn't had a closing in two years, but still scoots around town in the bright red $70,000 Mercedes. Except that illusion, that facade, has had catastrophic effects on our profession because it makes us seem more money-centric than client-centric. It makes us seem more into the business of law than the practice of law, and that has got to change. And if it does, maybe, just maybe, our communities will then come to see that while we do have too many lawyers, we could never have enough Atticus Finches.